Hello, Space Junkies, and welcome to episode 130 of What a Piece of Junk, the Star Wars podcast here on the Fandom Podcast Network. I am your host, Scott Botman, and joining me to discuss Chapter 6 of Ahsoka, it's our very own Dave Phil Cloney, Mr. Miracle, the gooey, chewy, man of a thousand nicknames, and my original Wookiee co-pilot, Mr. Nathan Miracle. Nathan, how's it going? It's going pretty well. I've got my mug. Aha, uh -huh. yes. Yep. Our thugs with mugs, baby. Thugs with I'm, mugs, I'm totally that's right. sticking with that theme. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been uh, pretty good. You know, it, uh, we had a little bit more time to digest this week's episode of Ahsoka, uh, since we're not recording on Wednesday night, but rather Sunday night. And uh, man, there was a lot to digest. Yeah, I was going to say it's a good thing, too, because uh, Part 6, Far, Far Away, had a whole lot going on uh, within the universe. So I was, you know, staring at the screen slack-jawed at a couple of points. So uh, we'll, we'll we'll get into it here in a moment. But I guess um, I, I'll, I'll deviate from the five questions just a little bit here at the beginning of the show to ask you, where are you hoping Ahsoka goes with its... Sadly, last two episodes, because we're heading forward seven and eight. Well, okay, it's it may be the last two episodes, but it's not the end of the story. We know that we're getting well, the sure. movie, yeah. so I hope that it sets up the movie well. I also would not be surprised if we have an Ahsoka season two. Yes, uh, and the question there would be, is Ahsoka season two going to be before the movie or after the movie? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it will be before the movie. I actually think that movie's going to get delayed. It's going to take more time than than people think. What? A movie get delayed? I, I've never <laughs> a heard Star of Wars such movie a thing. get delayed? No way. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think uh, your money is safe betting on delays. Uh, you get more of them than you don't, realistically. Yeah, for me, I hope that Ahsoka ends... Uh, if it does end on a cliffhanger at the end of season one, which I think it will, um, I hope it at least gets to a point where we don't have a cliffhanger for Balin Skull. Knowing, yes, of I course, agree. that real world concerns mean that, sadly, that character won't be back, at least not in the same way that he is now. Yeah, and it would be difficult to recast him. Uh, Ray's done such an awesome job with the character. I don't yeah. really want to see somebody else try to fill shoes that they're not meant to fill. Right, right. Okay, question uh, number one. What was your favorite part of the episode? Well, speaking of Ray, he had a particular line about Ezra being a Boken Jedi. Mm, I yes. love that. Uh, I misheard it the first time. I thought he said Balkan Jedi. I'm like, what in the world? Do they have the Balkans in Star Wars? No, that doesn't make any sense. But he actually said Boken Jedi. A Boken is a wooden sword that samurais would use to practice with. So it's the idea that he's not a real Jedi. He's, he's a wooden Jedi. Yeah. And there was a lot of samurai influence in this particular episode. Uh, that relates with uh, Enoch and the rest of the night troopers, uh, as the yeah. closed caption called them. Um, yeah. They had the the gold metallic, uh, which is re reminiscent of a particular practice in Japan. When you break a vase, you repair it with gold, and then it has a pattern. You don't just throw it out. And that's right. what Thrawn has been doing with these guys. It's pretty awesome to get all of that imagery and bringing in the samurai influences that have really influenced star wars from day one two big things yeah. samurais westerns those have been big influences on star wars yeah that asian repair technique of the gold thread running through the crack is called kintsugi by the way yeah i wasn't so... going to try to pronounce it <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's really cool that we see that on the armor of the stormtrooper, the night troopers. Um, and that's actually my answer to favorite part of this episode. I thought it was going to be when Ezra was found, but that was a little underwhelming for me. I'm mean, yeah. still happy about it. Um, and I enjoyed the way that it happened. But as far as reveals and cool stuff, for me, my favorite part of the episode was the night troopers and the Kintsugi on their armor with either the red 
uh, strap or plastic or whatever it may be, or in the case of Enoch and a few others, actual gold stuff, you know, weaved throughout the broken parts of their plastoid armor. Um, I note, of course, that the red is like the red robes of the Night Sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm thinking that it has some kind of force imbued power to repair their armor. Uh, I've seen some people online discussing among Star Wars fans that night troopers might all actually be zombie type troopers. Um, I did wow. not get that vibe from this episode. Lots of people seem convinced that they're going to be um, dark magic night sister zombie type stuff like Marak or we saw somewhat happen with Savage Opress in the Clone Wars cartoon. Um, I didn't get that vibe. I just thought that they had repaired their armor because they didn't have any resupply and, and fixing uh, capabilities. Um, what do you think? Do you think that the night troopers are zombie types like so, Zorok? I get the argument. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities there. Uh, we do have the night sisters. Thrawn does mention needing their dark magic again, which means he's used it for something in the past. We don't know exactly what. Uh, also, the Night Sisters are known to be able to do this sort of thing. We've seen it in the right. Clone Wars, yeah. so and it, we saw it in this show with uh, Morgan mm -hmm. Elspeth presumably doing it to Mark. Yeah, and the Night Brothers, like Savage Opress, were affected by the dark magic. Uh, that's why they're called Night Brothers, and these are Night Troopers. So there's an argument that you know, that's a, a link, and that's why they're called Night Troopers is because they are the zombified troopers. And also, we have Merrick, so we have this foreshadowing, or at least on this premise, this would be foreshadowing, that, right. oh yeah, this is something that Night Sisters can do, so it doesn't come as a complete shock when it happens later. All of that said, I don't think that's the case. Yeah, I, I, I think like they're, they, I, yeah, they I think they're bother... troopers who were on the Star Destroyer, when yeah. it got shot off into this galaxy far, far away. Yeah. Um, I, uh, second place, real close second place, favorite part of the episode was Hu Yang saying a long time ago in a galaxy far, 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 away. far away. I know yeah. that fandom is a little bit divided on that was amazing or that was incredibly cheesy. I fall way into it, the that was amazing cap. I love it. It can be both. It was yeah. amazing because of how cheesy it was. Yeah. Yeah. And we're definitely in a galaxy far, far away mm -hmm. in this episode. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm with you. I think the night troopers are stormtroopers. Or like, why would they bother to repair the armor if they were just going to do the animated dead thing? You, you'd, you'd see gaping holes in the armor with like zombie flesh or whatever, you know? Right. right. That would be that would be cooler, you know? And, 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 and it's not like says, Savage will press war armor to cover his face or anything. Right, right. And Thrawn says, our numbers have dwindled since we arrived here. If you have the mm -hmm. ability to make an army of undead, who cares how many of your troops get killed? You'll always have them, you know, schlepping around. Wrong, it, it, it's wrong, like that D&D &D meme where uh, one person says, you have my bow. The next person says, you have my axe. And then the necromancer says, you have your brother. Because <laughs> you were <laughs> right, going yeah, to... Yeah. Avenge your brother's Avenge death. Yeah, brother. Actually, you've yeah. got your brother. Yeah, we, we just brought him back. It's fine. Uh, yeah. It's it's not fine. It's dark magic. Not fine. But as far yeah. as your numbers, yeah, they wouldn't be dwindling if you can get the dead. You could get new dead from this planet, which is apparently populated. Kill some raiders. Yeah. Raise them from the dead. Yeah. Raise the raiders. Yeah, anyway. Ke um, Kevin Raider Nerd Reitzel would love yeah. it. He would absolutely sort of. approve. <laughs> maybe maybe right, not of so, the killing them and raising them from the dead part, but yeah, you know, yeah. of their existence. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's my favorite part is the, uh, the cool uh, Kintsugi uh, repair to the armor, uh, specifically Enoch as well. So we'll get, we'll talk a little bit more about Enoch later in this episode of the podcast. Uh, so moving on to question number two, what was your least favorite part of the episode? All right, so uh, I heard Derek talking a little bit on Friday about this, and I'm going to agree with him on it. And uh, unfortunately, he can't be with us today. He's a little bit under the weather, but we'll continue on in his spirit. And I think my least favorite part of this episode is the fact that it's still called Ahsoka. This season 
needs to be Rebel Season 5. There are just huge gaps in the story where Ahsoka's not there. And it's still about Ahsoka in a roundabout way, Mm -hmm. but it's not just about Ahsoka. It's about the entire Rebels crew. Yeah, and it's it's even more not just about Ahsoka, but about the New Republic dealing with the remnants of the Empire. It's almost not e- not even not about Ahsoka, but it's not about any one particular character. It's right. about how is the New Republic handling things during this time frame between the end of Return of the Jedi and basically the start of the sequel trilogy, um, which is fine and an, and an important time frame of Star Wars storytelling that I'm glad that we get to see it filled in because, I mean, that's one of the major complaints I heard about people that didn't like the sequels was, why did we jump ahead in time all this way to see our heroes die when we didn't get to see what led up to them being like they are now? Um, which, you know, is, of course, the way that Star Wars has worked forever, but people don't Pretty think much, of yeah. it that way. Um, so, but But the point is, it's not really an Ahsoka show, and my least favorite part of the episode is ex- exactly echoing yours, is that Ahsoka is in it for like three minutes, maybe mm-hmm. two minutes, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it, we don't even book in with her showing up at the end, which is right. what I was expecting the whole time. It's like, oh, well, yeah. it's still Ahsoka's show, Ahsoka should show up at the end, but she doesn't. So presumably, she'll show up next episode. But, you know, this is the same problem we had with the Book of Boba Fett, when we had yep. two whole episodes where we went off and had essentially Mandalorian season two and a half. Yeah. Star Wars just should not be named after a singular character. It's right. almost never about a singular character. Fortunately, the Mandalorian is broad enough that in season three, we could say, you yep, know, this applies to the people, the Mandalorian and not this one guy. But even, even that's Bo-Katan, a little bit of a stretch. Who is a Mandalorian? You know, she's mm-hmm. the Mandalorian right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's not just Din, and that's why that's good that it's not the Din Djarin show or the Grogu show. It's yeah. broader than that. It's the Mandalorian. That should be the case for Book of Boba Fett and Ahsoka too. They need different titles. And honestly, if we're if we're being uh, frank, Obi Wan suffered the same way. Because mm-hmm. often it was about little Leia or her family, you know, or or Reva, or yeah. Vader, or Vader, yeah, or <laughs> yeah. Vader. right, exactly. Star Wars is too big to confine to one person. That this is also why the original was not the Luke Skywalker saga or anything like that. Right, right. Uh, in fact, Lucas George Lucas toyed with calling it, um, you know, the saga of Luke Starkiller and, and so on and so forth. Um, sort of like he d- ended up doing with Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, right? Um, but he decided not to call it that and went with the broader name and told a broader story. Um, so I'm hoping that we sort of fix this problem with the upcoming Disney Plus Star Wars series, assuming that they remain as series, because who knows what's going to happen these days. Uh, but uh, the Acolyte is broad enough, much like The Mandalorian, um, to, for it to be a story about dark side force users and how they came to be. I think that's pretty much what we're expecting it to be. And then, of course, Skeleton Crew is quite literally about a group, a crew. And uh, again, The Bad Batch is about a group, right? So that story has, uh, that series has done a better job of making the story focused on multiple points of view and multiple characters. And we're okay with that because we weren't sold a bill of goods as you know star wars hunter or whatever right and rebels to to get even closer to ahsoka rebels was the whole cell so you had episodes that focused on ezra you had episodes that focused on sabine or zeb or kanan or hera or even chopper they're all yeah. rebels it all falls under that umbrella so that worked better than naming it after one person yeah totally All right, so question number three. What connections did you draw to the larger Star Wars galaxy? None. We were in an entirely different galaxy. (laughs) It's the first time we get to say that. You are No scenes happened in the Star Wars galaxy. 
that's right. You are technically correct, which is the best kind of correct. Um, and and yeah, it's really hard to say. Although uh, we, we do get a few with uh, Thrawn and his Star Destroyer, the Chimera, still has yep. the cool paint job underneath. By the way, were we supposed to be noticing the Kintsugi repair technique on the Chimera as well? Or were those I'm just sure. missing panels? I couldn't I... quite make it out. Is it supposed to be replaced with gold or they're just gone? I thought they were just gone. I thought they were too, but I saw some people online talking about, and I believe I heard our friends at Rebel Force Radio talking about how the Star Destroyer had some gold pieces in it. But I thought they were just missing panels and it was exposed like red, you know, rusted steel or, or dur excuse me, dura steel or duranium uh, mm -hmm. supports. Yeah, that, that's um, what I, I thought. I didn't too. think there was any repair work, any Kitsugi going on for the Star Destroyer. But it would be really cool if there was, though. So maybe we'll get a closer look at that next time. Uh, another yeah. uh, connection that I want to draw, not exactly to the Star Wars galaxy, but Thrawn himself has always had this kind of Dracula air to him. The yeah. music especially feels very Dracula. And we then... will find the study of your artwork to be very educational and useful in our new galactic home. Well, and they're loading up uh, these boxes of who knows what. It really reminded me of the boxes of Earth that Dracula took with him on the Demeter. Yes. Oh, look at you pulling out some Bram Stoker knowledge. I'm so proud. Um, I also agree that it made me think of boxes of rocks. However, I didn't draw a Dracula comparison. Love it. Um, but I was thinking about the Heir to the Empire novel series mm. and how in um, uh, Dark Force Rising, I think it's Dark Force Rising. No, it may be in The Last Command. I think it's in The Last Command. In The Last Command, after Grand Admiral Thrawn is bringing his grand plan all together, and he's stolen the Katana fleet, and he's got all these extra ships, and he's coming for Coruscant, and he bombards the planet with friggin' asteroids. So he uses mass drivers to attack the Rebellion, or, the, excuse me, the Republic. And uh, people in the Republic are all like, good lord, this is like against the Galactic Geneva Convention. How dare he use mass drivers? Um... And uh, they're one of the most terrible weapons in all of classical science fiction. Uh, there's a great scene in Babylon 5 <laughs> where Lando Malari stands on the bridge of a Centauri warship and watches mass drivers hurl asteroids at planets to, like, basically wipe out all life on continent-sized areas of the planet until the rest of the planet decides to give up and surrender. Um, and so Grand Admiral Thrawn does the same thing because he's willing to do anything, you know, to, to get his ultimate victory. I think those boxes are pieces of, if not the actual mass drivers that they're going to install on various ships when they re return to the Star Wars galaxy. I if they're not that, they're the actual ammunition for them, like giant chunks of the stone or whatnot that can be force applique, uh, have the force applied to them by dark magic from the dark sister, the, the, um, the, the night sisters. And so they're going to be mass drivers, but they're going to be hurled with like dark magic instead of actual uh you know weaponry oh. technolo technologically and they have to come from peridia because that's where the night sisters have their ancestral home so they need that connection to the force um i could be way off on this maybe they're not mass drivers at all the soil from the vampire's grave thing is in keeping with the idea of the uh possible zombie troops so you may be much closer to it than me but i'm still holding out hope for Thrawn has some cool super weapon that Star Wars fans haven't seen in this millennium, and mass drivers would be it, man. Yeah, that would be a great, uh, almost low-tech way of doing it. You know, when we have Death Stars and Starkiller base floating around in this galaxy, mm -hmm. you know, just throw a huge rock at it. Yeah, you know, this, yeah. this was when Ultron's plan. When his hit it with the <laughs> rock! My way is not very sportsmanlike. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. that would be incredible to see. And that's something I would like to see in the movie. So if that's yeah. the case, I kind of hope it's not explained what they are in this series. Oh, that'd be a cool cliffhanger. It's like, what the heck was in those coffin looking things that they were zero G loading onto the chimera? I'm also yeah. really excited to see 
um, the Chimera link up with the Eye of Scion to do the gigantic version of the <laughs> um, Jedi Starfighter hyperspace ring thing. Uh, yeah, I was you know it's coming. To, yeah, I was explaining that to my youngest son, Joseph, on um, Messenger the other day. He was like, why is the Eye of Scion so huge? And I'm like, well, you remember Attack of the Clones? He's like, yeah, that's my favorite Star Wars movie. I'm like, that's great. Remember how Obi-Wan had the ring for his Starfighter? He's like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, same basic shape. You know, triangular yeah. ship, docks in giant mm -hmm. ring. Yeah, and yeah. you know the Chimera can't make it by itself because, man, those hyperdrives on the back of that Chimera were uh, not in good shape. And I wonder if the Pergil somehow destroyed those purposefully to make it I could where... see that being the case. Yeah. I, I could um... see Ezra kind of directing them to do that because he has a connection know... to them. I want to know what happened to all the other Imperial ships because they pulled like a, 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 a fairly large fleet of Imperial ships into the uh, into Peridia. So my guess would be that a lot of them have gone to repairs of the Chimera. Maybe so. They've can they've cannibalized them for parts to extend the life of the command ship. We must access all of our resources. Okay, uh, I'll try to stop doing my Thrawn, but, uh, you know. It's, no, it's don't. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good. Yeah. Another connection to the rest of the Star Wars galaxy that I drew was the raiders that Sabine has to fight and, you know, are standing there watching Balin Skull and Shin Hati. Um, their, one of their guys had that headgear that made me think of um, uh, uh, the... the, the uh, not Commissar, but the Constable Zuvio made me think of Constable mm. Zuvio. I'm, yes, in I know who you're talking about. Scene from Star yeah, Wars with the, the, the big Wars. round helmet. Yeah, he appears yeah. in the Clone Wars a couple times. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know that they ever name him in the Clone Wars. I'd have to go back and double check that. But yeah, the big helmet is very iconic. Very yeah, much stands out. It's reminiscent of um, the rice patty helmet or hats mm -hmm. that uh, Asian peasants would wear the Ashigaru uh, back in the day when they were in the rice paddies and growing things for the samurai. So again, another Asian influence and samurai movie influence. There were several scenes during the fight on Peridia where Sabine is dealing with those raiders that made me think of Star Wars visions. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. There's a lot of duels in Star Wars Visions. Mm -hmm. I would dare say most of the episodes have some sort of duel in them. And of course, Sabine is using Mandalorian fighting techniques when mm -hmm. she is fighting those. So she's not really... She, she pulls out the lightsaber and uses it some, but prior to that, she's all pistoling and blocking things with her Beskar gauntlets and all that stuff. Yeah, she doesn't reach out with the Force to grab somebody. She reaches out with her grappling hook cable. Yep, the whipcord is coming into action and she's using all of her weapons designer and, you know, weapons are part of my religion background. So that was really cool as a connection to not any, not just any part of the Star Wars galaxy, but the Mandalorian, the the, the grandfather of all Star Wars streaming series. Mm -hmm. All right, so question number four. Now, I did this one this week. Is that the real Ezra that Sabine found, or some kind of clone, or illusion, or just some kind of trick? What do you think, Nathan? Is that the real Ezra? I think it's the real Ezra. Dude, okay. Straight up, I think it's the real Ezra. I don't think that's a trick or anything. If it had been what I expected to see, which was just, you know, we see him, and then the episode cuts to Ahsoka arriving, and then the episode ends, then I might be willing to say, well, that could be an illusion or a trick or something because we just saw him and didn't interact with him. The fact that they talk to each other, Sabine very much thinks that he's real. I feel like he's real too. Uh, plus, he has connected with these beings on this planet. That's a very Ezra thing to do. You know, yes, I can't is. communicate with these guys. We don't share a common language, but I don't share a common language with the giant space whales. And I was able to get <laughs> right. them to do what I wanted. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. He, he can make those connections without having the verbal language. 
Right. I, and, and even though the little Nazi, uh, the little hermit crab looking guys are not technically animals, they feel much more like a sentient species, almost yeah. like um, Ewoks or Jawas, you know, that kind of thing. Very much um, so. They, um, I think that Ezra, like you said, has been able to use his gifts within the Force to communicate with them telepathically almost. Almost the way that Ahsoka did with Grogu. Um, and uh, so, yes, I too think that this is the real Ezra. I've seen a very small amount of chatter online amongst Star Wars fans that this might be some sort of clone or illusion or fake. But so far, Dave Filoni doesn't like to do a lot of gotcha moments uh, right. when it comes to his writing. And so if this were J.J. Abrams or maybe even Ryan Johnson uh, making this show, I could see that happening, especially Ryan Johnson. He loves to do... Um, a mystery for you to figure out without necessarily revealing all the cards in his hand at the, at the beginning of the series, um, like with uh, Knives Out, um, and especially but, Knives Out, Glass Onion. But he always does it in such a way that if you go back and rewatch it, you can see that the clues were there the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if um, this isn't, if this were Ryan Johnson and this wasn't the real Ezra, then we would be able to go back and watch and say, oh, well, you know, here's where we should have realized it wasn't the real Ezra because this, 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 and this. Yeah. Um, and so because this is Dave Filoni, he's way more straightforward. The, the only the only uh, mysteries that he's trying to do, he'll actually give you the obvious answer through symbolism. And so the fact that, like we said, this Ezra was able to interface with the Nazi, the Nazi and uh or noti i'm not sure how to pronounce it um and that he's you know the appropriate age and and look i think really is to tell us that yes this is ezra uh the one that you know ran off with the MacGuffin uh a while ago and now he's back it so much so that uh he like a hobbit has come back and is wearing a chainmail shirt under his regular mm -hmm. clothes <laughs> Um, did you notice? I mean, I mean, maybe I'm misreading that, but I think that that chainmail shirt is supposed to show us that he is very much like a Baggins's here. Um, whether it's yeah, Frodo or I, Bilbo, I'm not sure yet. I did not catch that, but I saw you point it out and point out the connections to Lord of the Rings, and I love that. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, we've, we've got, got so got, much already. Exactly. We've got uh, Ahsoka the White, who mm -hmm. rose from being Ahsoka the gray she fell and mm -hmm. rose again as the white so we've got absolutely a lot of lord of the rings uh symbolism a lot of parallels uh illusions i, I guess you might call it yeah illusions yeah so and i think that's one more is a, yes thrones a further allusion almost to being saruman um, because he's kind of in his uh, night troopers are kind of like his urukai, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, he's he's up in his tower. on them. Yep. Yep. And the 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 place that that the chimera comes and docks very much looks like Minas Tirith, uh, from the Lord of the Rings movie series. Like it's almost built into the side of a mountain there. Right. Right. So yeah, all good stuff. And yeah. we know that Dave Filoni loves Lord of the Rings, so I don't think any of this is accidental. No, no, definitely not. Okay, uh, so that's question four. And Nathan, you've got question five this week, so what is question five? Yeah, question five is, who is Enoch? Uh, mm -hmm. As best as I can tell, this is the first time we've come across this character. Uh, so I've got some ideas, some theories uh, I'd like to hear uh, what you think. Um, do you have his, any ideas before I jump into anything? So his, his presence and the way that he gives Sabine the Howler uh, to ride the mount, the, the rodent of unusual size, which is all I can think of <laughs> I, when I saw that thing. I thought of, this looks a whole lot like a wolf, because it is okay, Dave Filoni yes. after all. Yeah, yes, it does. Um and it, and it was very canine in its activities, way mm -hmm. more so than it was equine or like I was thinking Rodentia. Um, so yeah, it's very it's probably our, our wolf analog. Plus the the closed captioning refers to it as a howler, and wolves are famous wolves are for their howls. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So anyway, the way that he interacts with the thing and the way he talks to Sabine, and he's all like, die well. That's what makes me really think that neither he nor any of the night troopers are zombies. They seem like real okay. warriors, right? And so my theory is that Enoch is, so he's not Captain Paleon because Captain Paleon is in the Mandalorian at, as part of the Shadow Council. Um, and we know he's not Rook because in this continuity um, of Disney uh, current Star Wars canon, uh, Thrawn's bodyguard of Rook has been killed already, died during a fight with uh, Zeb in Rebels. Um, so I'm trying to figure out who he might be, and I think he might be one of the other Stormtrooper cadets that Sabine and Ezra interacted with when they, when Sabine and Ezra went undercover as Stormtrooper cadets on Lothal. Um, now that would mean Enoch would have grown up and is now kind of the same age as both Sabine and Ezra because they were all children-esque or, you know, young adult uh, adolescents at the same time back on Lothal. Um, now, I don't know that for sure, and I can't think of any one particular Stormtrooper cadet that was, like, gung-ho about fighting for the Empire that would have, uh, you know, gone on to join the Corps and now would be, like, Thrawn's second in command. But if that is who it turns out to be, or a character like that, uh, that would make sense to me, and I think that would be an interesting way to to bring to, to closure the story arc of one of those nondescript background kids of the Empire, if you will. Um, that's my only operating theory. I can't think of him being any one particular named character from Rebels, but I could be wrong. What what do you got? What, did you, what are your thoughts? Who is Enoch for your idea? Well, I don't think that he is a named character from Rebels. Uh, I think he is just the captain of the guard for Thrawn. That said, if that's not the real Ezra. Or if there is something going on with Ezra, I think right. Enoch would be the clone. Okay. So if we do get the uh, Heir to the Empire trilogy, mm -hmm. oh, look, we, our fourth sensitive person has a clone of them, I think it would be revealed at the end. Hey, this Enoch guy, whose face we have conspicuously never seen, right. is the clone of Ezra. Uh, now, I don't really think that's the case but if we do go the clone, clone route i i think he's the most likely candidate for that uh, i think more so he was named purposely for the biblical character enoch who yeah, yeah. didn't do much in the bible right. <laughs> he, he only has he... Yeah, it, yeah, it's more about what he didn't do and what he didn't do was die uh, he if I recall correctly, was Methuselah's father. And I, uh, so. uh, I know that he's in that lineage, at least. Uh, there's a whole lineage from Adam to Noah. That includes uh, Noah's father, Lamech, Lamech's father, Methuselah. And then I forget exactly beyond that. Um, uh, yes, you are correct. He is, according to the Bible, Methuselah's father. And he yeah. did not die but he lived 365 years before he was taken by God. Yes, and the, that phrase, taken by God, is generally interpreted to mean that he didn't die, that he was just out walking in the wilderness one day, and then, poof, he's gone. God took him up into heaven, and that's it. Yeah, so. fascinating that the idea here, of course, if we're thinking about the night troopers being zombies, being undead, uh, the undying Enoch would, of course, be the chief among them because he didn't even he's not even a zombie. He just can't. He just never dies. Um, but yeah, that idea that he could be that the night troopers could be zombies and Enoch is chief among them uh, would be in keeping with a different interpretation of his name. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. So now I'm thinking maybe the people are right about the whole these guys can't die, and the reason that they do all the kintsugi on their armor is to keep the green stuff from leaking out. Like, you know... Like what happened with Marek. Yeah, the reason Marek died is because you, they cut open his armor. So, fascinating. Yeah, that might be right, then. That might be right about the whole... They're not zombies, per se. They're that animated armor thing, and the spirit within them is like a ghost, and if you let out the, the green smoke, then the armor collapses and they, they dissipate. Yeah, and I really think the strongest argument for that is the fact that we got Merrick. 
and Merrick didn't really do anything, but he would really serve a purpose if that was just foreshadowing for, oh, hey, we have a whole army of this guy. Yeah. Now, re refresh my memory a bit about Savage Opress and the Knight Brothers. Was it important that their bodies were still around? Because now we're thinking about those things that the night troopers were uh, loading onto um, the Chimera could very well be coffins if the bodies are important. With Savage Opress, he didn't really die. He uh, won a tournament, uh, mm -hmm. which was basically a, a Mortal Kombat style tournament where he, you, know, you fight to the death for several rounds and the person who survives wins the tournament. And what's your prize? you get to be the new apprentice to Count Dooku. But they okay. enchanted him to make him much larger and stronger and more physically imposing than he was when he was still on Dathomir. Uh, not real clear why they didn't do that with Maul, because Maul's kind of short, quite frankly. Because right, uh, right. Ray Park's not that big of a dude. Yeah, he's pretty short, yeah. Uh, and he is Ray Park-sized. That's what happens when you have an actor. Right. Uh, so Savage Opress is like a foot and a half or more taller than Maul. Uh, and yet Maul's the one in charge because Maul knows what's going on. Um, yeah. Savage Opress wasn't dead. He just had a bunch of enchantments on him. Um, now, when he died, those all released and you get the, the green smoke and that he kind of withers away. So it's not a case of them needing the body but Merrick seems to be something slightly different because his armor just kind of collapses when he dies. Yeah. So it's almost as though there's not a body in there, whereas Savage Opress did have the body. He okay. just was still using it. Right, right. Interesting. So maybe I'm a little bit off on needing the bodies and totally empty suits of armor. Then again, perhaps it's well, just a new, maybe a you're new not. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We know they can do enchantments, so maybe the way they do enchantments is okay. We keep your body somewhere, and move your spirit into these animated armors. Yeah, and it's a bit like a, a lich in Dungeons and Dragons, where where you need the phylactery. The phylactery, you can destroy it, then the wherever the body of the the suit of armor is, it'll collapse and you know wither to nothingness. Um, but that whole existing in gaseous form is also a very vampirical thing. Uh, Bela mm -hmm. Lugosi's Dracula does it in the original Dracula film from the 1930s, from Universal Classic Horror. Um, and of course, modern vampire films, contemporary vampire films, you see bad guys doing that kind of thing all the time. They're turned to a bat, or if they're not a bat, they'll turn into mist and like roll back into their coffin just as the sunlight is coming, rolling, creeping across the, uh, the scene. Um, and they're like, ah, you missed me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I see what they did there. <laughs> but you know, they could originally turn into wolves too. That's right. Oh, hey, more wolf stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we've seen um, Gary Oldman turn into a wolf during uh, the 1990s Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, so, yeah, that's definitely a possibility in vampire lore. And yeah, like you said, uh, Thrawn has always had a vampire air about him in live action and animation uh, Star Wars. I didn't get it that much from reading the original Heir to the Empire novels, um, but certainly the way that they portray him on screen has been almost vampiric with the red the, eyes and the dark skin. And the music is... Yeah. I mean, you could put that music over a Dracula movie and you would yeah. think it was written for it. Yeah, totally. All right, well, that is our five questions for this week. So whoever Enoch turns out to be, you can be sure that we'll discuss it to death or even beyond death on this show. Um, apologies to Kevin, but we're not really going to have time for a commercial break uh, this episode, except, of course, for this commercial break, and that is what Star Wars T-shirts are we wearing this week? Nathan, I had tacos sweet potato poblano tacos for dinner tonight so of course i had to wear my chewy's Juan solo t-shirt that has of course the classic 1970s animation or drawing of han solo pulling out his blaster pistol but instead of a blaster pistol it is 
chili peppers. Brought to you by your friends at Chewy's Mexican Restaurant, a chain that has an outlet in Charlotte, but just isn't quite as good as they were before the pandemic, unfortunately. Their, their menu has really decreased. Although, having said that, I have not eaten at Chewy's since probably 2022, so maybe I should give them another try someday soon. Either way, they still have epic Tex-Mex crossover t-shirts like this one, a clear Star Wars parody of Juan Solo. What you got there for t-shirts this week, Nathan? Well, I knew that we were going to be talking about Dave Filoni and wolves, and also some more wolves, and did I mention wolves? So yeah. I am wearing my wolf pack shirt. Uh, yes. This is a loth wolf. Uh, this is very much a Star Wars thing. No, it has nothing to do with NC State. It's not even the right colors. I don't know why people <laughs> right. ask, but I get that question all the time. Oh, did you go to NC State? No. No, no I did no. not. Why, why are you asking? This, me? this, this is, is not, even not red. red. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you guys out there would like your own cool What a Piece of Junk t-shirt or perhaps coffee mug so you can join the thugs with mugs or ipad case or phone case or mouse pad or any of the other cool stuff for any of the fandom podcast network shows please head over to tpublic.com and search up fandom podcast network in the user bar uh nathan tell folks where they can find us on ye old interwebs there are tons of places you can find us you can find us on apple Podcasts, stitcher podbean spotify iHeartRadio, google play youtube Pretty much anywhere that you get podcasts, you can find us. You can also find us on Facebook at What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast, or email us at What a Piece of Junk Pod at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at What Wars, or should I say X? I don't really know at this point. Me either. Uh, and I don't care. <laughs> on Instagram, <laughs> uh, we have the F Fandom Podcast Network. That's not just What a Piece of Junk, that is all of our podcasts. And if you do find us on anything that allows you to give a rating, we would love to get a great rating from you and comments about what we do well, what we don't do well, how we can better serve you with all your Star Wars needs. Yep, absolutely. So please search up the Fandom Podcast Network on Apple Podcasts and so on and so forth and leave a review for What a Piece of Junk in particular. And we love five-star reviews because you don't want to upset the Wookiee. But we appreciate your honesty even more so. So if you don't think we deserve five stars, then don't give us five stars. Give us five star wars. No, I'm just kidding. Um, just uh, let us know. So we want to thank all of our listeners for joining us on this episode. And of course, we want to thank you for participating in Star Wars fandom in general. And please, always remember to respect each other and always respect each other's fandom. All right, Nathan punch it. Uh.